So welcome everyone. Um, our guest today is Dr. Michael Yellowbird. I came across Dr. Yellowbird's work maybe a year and a half ago or so um, and was really amazed by his wisdom and the perspectives on what he calls neuro decolonization and he'll be talking a lot more about that today. Um, I reached out about eight months ago and thought maybe we could have him come to Williams Lake and do some presentations but because of COVID this is about as close as we're going to get for the next foreseeable time so um, I'll just you know, give a brief introduction and then Dr. Yellowbird will take over. So Dr. Yellowbird is of Arikara and Hidatsa ancestry and he is a celebrated scholar, author, inspirational teacher and passionate advocate for decolonization indigenous social innovation and creativity and institutional and environmental systems change. He has recently been appointed as the Dean of Faculty of Social Work at the University of Manitoba, and we are very excited to have him here. Welcome, Dr. Yellowbird. Thank you. So I guess I'll... Hello? Hi. Oh, so if we can make sure that everyone's um, not unmuting themselves. So just make sure that your, your camera stays on mute. Otherwise, it'll shift to you on the main screen. Okay, we ready to start? You bet, go for it. Okay, so I just want to thank everyone for um, attending today and your presence and I, I'm, I'm really happy to be here to kind of talk about some of my work and how I think some of the work can be helpful um, to um, the uh, um, you as, as folks who you know are in the field work in the field are interested in the topic so I, um, I know it's a very short time so I just wanted to go ahead and get started right away and start my screen share um, um, this uh, particular slide if you can see it um, is uh, my oldest daughter meditating and uh, this is what I've sort of done a lot of my research on is contemplative practices and looked at contemplative practices like mindfulness and meditation as um, as you know uh, in a very scientific and also in a very traditional way and to come to understand the power of the mind and the different parts of the mind that really are powerful allies in healing and how we can um, bring about that healing by doing certain kinds of things. So the presentation I have today has got a lot of slides, so I'm not gonna go through all the slides. So first I apologize for having so many slides because generally this, I, I do a talk that's much longer and it's kind of based on some work and a book I'm trying to finish now. So um, if we just go ahead and um, if I can just start now, let's see if that's not gonna work. Uh, oh, okay, sorry. So basically, um, Neurodecolonization is this. Our brains, you know, we have all these experiences that we sort of store in our memory. We only don't, don't store them in our memory, we store them in our bodies, we store them in our uh, cells, we store them in our, uh, the proteins, and we, we store them, you know, in our um, um, different, you know, neurochemistry. But we also have um, stored memories that come from a long, long time ago that we've, that, you know, epigenetically have been sent down by uh, relatives a long, long time ago. And, um, it's not only like brain experiences, but sometimes it's genetic material, and I'll get to some of that. So neurodecolonization is about this. How can we change our experience with colonization by changing the brain structure and function, what they call neuroplasticity? And that's the idea that the brain is a very plastic organ, meaning that it can change with experience and new um, um, tasks. And, and uh, as you learn new things, the brain is always changing. Uh, also, neurodecolonization is about how does our environment trigger or silence really important gene expression? And that's something that's kind of the cutting edge right now. And we're seeing that in terms of, of you know, when, when, uh, people who may have genes that, you know, um, have higher levels of anxiety are more likely to commit suicide or, or have depression, right? Uh, and a lot of us indigenous people have particular genes that uh, make us vulnerable to depression. And anxiety, but there's some really important things that you know um, that um, show that we can be protected against you know uh, those kinds of things, um, and I'll I'll get to that too. So neurodecolonization is always interested what parts of the brains are being activated, 
there are a lot of different you know brain parts of the brain like the prefrontal cortex all the way to the uh, parietal lobe which is the lobe you know sometimes they call it the god lobe or the creator lobe and the occipital lobe which is about you know, seeing and and so i'll talk about some of those um how do our brain waves change you know when we're in a more relaxed place which is good because once the brain waves change into a more sort of functional what they call um uh, an alpha level of, they're more they're more the modulation or the wave is more smooth it's not like choppy right um, and there's a lot of things that you know get our brains to do that so what i'm talking about is kind of the cutting edge stuff um how to sp uh, um, uh, specialized brain cells uh, um, um, work you know like mirror neurons when we see stress when we see uh, anxiety or when we see things that make us happy or we see people that make us fearful or see, we see people that make us feel good these are all the things that are happening in the brain that we have to come to understand there are neurotransmitters that are the um, there's a lot of language and um, I'll get to some of this language but the neurotransmitters how the brain transmits um, <clears throat> how the brain transmits information. And modulators means it's how does it sort of control how the information is, is, uh, is uh, sent, right? And then there's also other things that happen, you know, that affect, you know, our, our brain. It's how much, you know, it's like our, our gut biome, what kinds of foods we eat and, and that sort of thing. So um, I'm just gonna continue to go on here and um, let's see. go to the next slide. So really I, what I wanted to do is talk a little bit about the medicine wheel. Just briefly about that, how we can use it, and how I've used this is in decolonizing ourselves. Also about you know what we can learn from our ancestors and their worldviews that they had, which you know, and the ways that they lived and how they practiced healing. I want to show you some slides that I think you're going to be really interested in um, that show you know engaging in certain kinds of things has amazing sorts of um, outcomes for our genes as well as our brains, and then. I'm not going to do so much sharing of neuroscience or, or microbiome uh, genetic science terms. That's in a longer presentation, but I'll, I will cover some of those. A um, <clears throat> little bit about the science, traditional knowledge about trauma and resilience. Um, we'll talk a little bit about you know uh, certain kinds of, as I said, genetics and epigenetic uh, things and and so on. Um, and some of the fixes and some of the things that help you know us when we're we're in a place where we need to uh, affect the change in our genetics so on the bottom are my two daughters they were, this was taken a while ago um uh, probably about 10 years ago now or eight years ago so <clears throat> but when we engage in neuro decolonization essentially what we're doing is is we're um we're really focusing on how do we liberate our minds you know from the damaging effects of colonization. What kinds of things are we doing now that are harming our brains, our bodies? What kinds of thoughts are we thinking? What kinds of you know interactions are we having, or the lifestyle you know that that are that have a um, cost on us? Um, so it's all neurodecolonization. Decolonization, of course, is this active thing to sort of resist these forces of colonial uh, colonial oppression and to do and to begin to neutralize how our brains, our minds, our bodies, and uh, lands, all these things have been subjected, right? But before we can do anything, really, you know, and I think this is why a lot of uh, things have only been so successful in treating and healing uh, our people is that we um, have to have decolonization happening in our minds first. So I want to start by just sharing how I think all these things come together in, in the medicine wheel. Our, our brain parts, our genes, our microbes, our cellular and molecular systems, and so on. All these things are based upon the relationship we had with our environment. And, they, and it's pretty clear that when we look at the medicine wheel, these things are there, you know, because there's all the different parts, the cardinal directions and that sort of thing. All the elements are there. And we'll see that, you know, as we look at these pictures, you know, uh, of the medicine wheel, that the medicine wheel is very ancient. This is the uh, medicine wheel of the Bighorn Montanas in Wyoming, it's about 10,000 years old. And what's interesting about this is that each one of those um, lines coming from the center go to sacred sites and places throughout Turtle Island. Um, when you look at it from high above, you'll see that, you know, this is where tribes from all over North America, 
So we all have you know, very similar DNA when you start looking at the uh, DNA level, something I've studied. Uh, we're all here kind of um, um, just coming together, you know, trading and dancing and praying and these kinds of, these kinds of things were, were really um, symbols, I should say, and, and these landmarks were really important back in the day. This one is uh, the one I'm talking about at the Bighorn Mountains uh, at the edge of the uh, mountain here. So you can imagine, they call it the place where the eagles sing, where all these tribes would come and they would spend time up there and camp up there and be all together. Um, this is kind of the way it looks in the morning as the morning's coming up. Um, and what people do, you'll see a lot of indigenous people visit this place. They leave dream catchers. They also leave a lot of prayer offerings and prayer flags all around. So the area is kind of now roped off to protect it. And you see the same thing happening among other indigenous cultures, like Buddhists have prayer flags as well. Um, you know, colors are very significant and they offer certain kinds of prayers. So you're seeing indigenous cultures now have a much larger, larger view of the world around them, you know, and that's, that's the state that people are, are in and that's still part of our, our DNA, right? Um, this is uh, Sundance down in my part of the country. Again, you see the same thing. This is, you know, not taking, taken very long ago. Again, you see the cloth, the prayer, the people, the circle, the dancing, all these things. So another medicine wheel in North Dakota, which really uh, was built by folks to kind of, uh, as a replica of the one in, um, in Wyoming. And this is at Haskell Indian Nations University in Lawrence, Kansas, um, where it used to be a residential school. And you see um, off, to the, off to the right here, you can see my pointer here. Uh, these are the people coming here to pray. These are people going around, probably all getting ready to pray. Uh, the water birds here. So you, you see the influence from the southern tribes, you know, in the, uh, uh, you know, their symbols and symbols here, the north, this is the south, the east, water bird, bird coming in, the west. So these are, you know, things that people are restoring. This is really um, a, an important um, landmark. Judah Kula Rock, which is in Kalawi, North Carolina. The very ancient rock, probably uh, it came from around 3,000 years ago in this, what they call the late archaic period. Um, so as you look at it, what symbols do you see? Well, a lot of times what people say is that some of the first symbols they see is like this particular being with this child or this little one going up this trail here and ascending into or going another path, another way, and people moving you know, and animals moving, um, insects, you know, all different kinds of things to go around and look at this, all these different creatures. And a lot of these were made for, by different tribes all over the Eastern coast 3,000 years ago and more, right? So you're thinking, wow, these tribes are like, they're, they're interacting. They're, 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 you know, talking about these really important cosmic kinds of things. And they're having this experience among them so all of these signs, uh, I was told, I was down there in uh, North Carolina, I was told by the elders down there that, you know, this is a very important sort of uh, um, um, landmark because tribes were not only coming here, but the, the, the symbols that they were painting were symbols that sort of represented who they were and where they had come from. So if you look here, remember the people say Turtle Island? Here's Turtle Island, right here, right? And there you see the medicine wheel. So it's no, you know, thing that say, well, people call it Turtle Island. 3,000 years ago or more, people were understanding, you know, um, really what Turtle Island was. And as you see more and more that this is like the medicine wheel. This is in Utah at Indian Creek State Park. And again, the different, you know, um, ancient peoples here. These are like our ancestors, right? Their footprints and they're making their way around. This is in uh, Hopi territory down in Arizona. Again, you see all these um, effigies and pictographs of people and beings, and of course the circle here. Another close up, the Mojave Desert. Here's the sun sign, but the sun sign is actually, if you see that, it's an inverted medicine wheel, right? And the other one in uh, Montana, the, the wheels were on the inside pointing out. This one, if you put another ring around there, it would be the same as the medicine wheel down there. So this is way down in the Mojave Desert. This is on my reservation on the Mandan, Hiradza, and Rikara in North Dakota. That's uh, where I grew up. This is uh, 
a big medicine wheel on the side here as we go across the Missouri River that um, uh, young people built in the 90s when, uh, you know, after a Sundance. I was one of those young people at that time. And um, we, uh, you know, made the marker. So here's, this is in the desert here too, um, which is really interesting because there you start seeing, look at that, there's a medicine wheel, another one, and look at this. Someone talked about this being um, a sea creature, right? But at the end of that, you see a medicine wheel, right? So the point I'm making is that this is ancient knowledge, and what I'm going to be talking about is ancient knowledge, but yet there is Western knowledge that's kind of caught up to that, that I think is really important. And this is sort of what my model looks like now today, with the mind, the body, the spirit, and the emotions. So with the mind, we have what we call neuroplasticity, what I mentioned earlier, the, how the brain can change. Neurogenesis, genesis is like the beginning, and neuro is like our neurons in our brain, the beginning of the growth of new neurons in our brain by doing certain kinds of things, and I'll show you what those things are. The human microbiome, I'm not gonna talk about, it. I took all my slides out today because there's too many to talk about, but if we think about all the bacteria that lives in our guts, it lives up our noses and our bodies, that is like another great circle of life think about it there's all these trillions of you know uh, bacteria that live in our guts that keep us healthy that our ancestors passed down to us they passed down to us from what they ate how they moved how they slept what they drank how they did ceremony we still have some of those very rare species in our in our guts i took a microbiome test and i found they found 10 rare species in me that I have that like, you know, most people, a lot of people don't have those. Um, and I, I, was a credit, I was crediting that to, you know, of course, my indigenous ancestors. Uh, I'm gonna talk a, a bit more about the, the uh, neuro decolonization in terms of contemplative practices, but I'm also gonna talk and kind of end uh, about what, what does it mean to inherit, you know, uh, epigenetic, you know, um, 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 uh, material. What does that mean to us, right? It, sometimes it means a great deal and, um, when people are you know, looking at um, who we are, as I say, and, and what we do, it's really about our culture, our experiences, perceptions that, cha that shape our, our, our plasticity and the changing of our brain, affect our great circle of life in our belly, and also affects the expression of our genes and brain waves. And all the way down, I mentioned that earlier. How do you heal and transform from the diseases of colonization? Well, my discovery is that it's you, we need to rediscover ancestral knowledge and practices. That's pretty clear now. So in order to do that, you know, in this last piece here, what are those, some of those things? And they're very easy to uh, accomplish. And we've been doing some of them already. We just haven't done enough movement, sleeping, you know, right, laughter and humor, being around the people. So fasting is something that's very important that we all have kind of forgotten about. Uh, uh, mindfulness practices, um, doing things that you know create mild stress in our in our bodies and i'll talk a little bit about that and why that's good uh I'm paying attention to you know uh, circadian rhythms are you out in the sun enough do you you know do you get up with the sun do you go to bed with the sun and of course being outdoors colonization looks like this there's the welcome intrusion and the invasion that happens you know in in, in uh, one group or could be covid 19 or whatever um it's all the same and then you have a period of contamination where you have contact, let's say, with someone who has COVID-19 or someone who is, you know, has smallpox or, or maybe has uh, foreign ideas or whatever. Your immune system, in many cases, get, gets overwhelmed with the infection and uh, death or sickness sets in. Maybe you survive it, maybe you don't. And um, some of the ways that we fight infection has a lot to do with our health. Um, how, you know, how healthy we are, how much activity we have, and sometimes has a lot to do with the genes we inherit from our ancestors, whether or not we have the immunities to that. So if we survive colonization, like many of us have, then we become colonized, right? With the ideas, the beliefs, the values, and the practices of colonization, right? Uh, become part of our li everyday lives. We are no longer overwhelmed by colonization. I mean, it's not gonna kill us like, like in here now, it'll maybe kill us you know, 20 years from now if we keep on eating bad foods or if we smoke cigarettes or if we have too much anxiety and worry, you know, we may have a heart attack you know, 20 years or 30 years down the road. Anyway, these are, these are some of the things that happen in colonization. What is decolonization? This is another model that I have. It's, it's a cleansing period, right? 
in, in what I talk about in neurodecolonization is we strip away harmful, invasive thoughts and practices, values that have been imposed by colonizing structures, right? And that are mismatches for, the, for our lives, right? They, they, colonization brought in these different things. They don't match the way we live. And so we have to cleanse ourselves from that. The Renaissance period then is kind of a period I think that we're in now. Um, and um, we're, we're, there's a restoration of cultural practices, thinking and beliefs that were abandoned or you know, taken away during colonization. But when we look at, as we go through, you're gonna see that there are some cultural practices that are very relevant, necessary for survival and well-being today. Um, and that's what neurodecolonization is about. What else is there? There's an enlightenment period that, you know, even though there's colonization, colonizing people came in, we can still use technology, words, beliefs, and those kinds of things to contribute to the advancement of indigenous people. Many of us have cell phones. Many of us use the technology we're using now. This is the technology that, you know, is going to help bring about enlightenment about how we can do things, you know, um, differently in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a new kind of way, yet not lose our, ourselves or lose, you know, our progress. So this is what, um, this is what the model looks like. There was another world where we lived. That world fell from colonialism. It's reborn to this world with the things that we see. And this world actually is, is in the process of dying right now. We see that. We see a lot of you know, economic collapse. We see a lot of infectious diseases. We see something huge people don't even think about much anymore because of COVID-19 and that's climate change, which is happening. So my sort of guess is that the people that are gonna survive are, this, are the ones that have survived, you know, uh, his ancestors have survived these big things like climate change and, and a big change. So, um, but that means that we have to sort of get back to, you know, those practices. So this is just um, um, a picture of, of neurodecolonization where these two chiefs, our holy people here are, are, are blessing the brain, smudging it off and singing to it to help release these horses there, which are really neurons that are coming from the brain. And the, and the neurons are, are going back to, <clears throat> to the, uh, to the um, traditional ways. <clears throat> this is a copy of our book. Uh, we published in, 19, in 2013, sort of seven years since that book came out. But, um, but it, um, that's what I talk about is that the importance of going back towards, you know, that I think is one way to restore culture. This woman here is called the woman who makes everything grow. In our cultures, you know, down south, we have, you know, uh, women are very, very prominent. And they are the growers, the life givers. And so you see her kind of, uh, um, at the, her finger here, you see her, um, um, you know, being life, that sort of thing. So, Let's go on to what some of these things are in terms of uh, uh, the, the um, <clears throat> medicine wheel. So the mind part. Um, the mind part is, as I said, neuroplasticity, which is the brain's ability to change, to get stronger, to, um, you know, to get more dense with knowledge and information. And neurogenesis, which means to, which, which is, means to grow more and more neurons. If you learn another language, if you learn another skill, if you learn how to do things, or if you, you know, change your scenery and you have to go up and down really rocky mountains or do something differently and you have to do it every day and you have to, your brain has to work to do that, you're growing new neurons. Or if you start running or if you start doing certain kinds of things, all of that brings about uh, healing. So in this particular slide here, you'll see that these are what I call very, very traditional practices, right? These, there's, I say eight, but there's actually more than that um, that I've added to this uh, slide. But running, dancing, singing, sleeping is something that's so important because it relates to our circadian rhythms. Um, without proper sleep, you know, I'll talk about that just in just a bit. Um, also, laughter and humor are so important. Um, I, I'm working with a group right now uh, that's working with a, a bunch of uh, folks down in the rain, Amazon rainforest. A lot of tribes down there have been hit really, really hard by COVID-19. And one of the things I'm writing about and kind of trying to help coach them on is that laughing and humor, even in the face of all this stuff that's going on, 
has very powerful effects. Um, and I'll talk about what those effects are and why it's so important to laugh so much more than to, than to be in a, a state of historical trauma, because that's what's happening to the people in, in, in the uh, rainforest right now. They, they, they are facing really deep trauma because of their villages are being attacked by COVID-19. Collectivism, all being together is very powerful. And I'll talk a little bit about what that does to the genes. Intermittent fasting, I just wrote an article about that. Meditation, and adaptive stress. Um, how many times do you go into the sauna and sweat lodge and so on? That's really important. And, and how many times do you fast? Those kinds of things. And then, of course, being outside. So I want to um, um, kind of uh, move um, through this just real quickly. Um, why is it that neurodecolonization says that movement is important? Well, this is kind of like um, a movement-centric um, um, slide here because a lot of times there are people that have, you know, uh, a, a movement of, um, uh, disability, and, um, and that's not to sort of leave them out, but to just to talk about how it's important, you know, for us to move. We have the biology and physiology to move. A lot of us don't move, and it affects our moods. It affects our weight, it affects you know, our age, it affects a lot, and a lot of different things it affects. Um, just, <clears throat> just looking at it, we see that running is in our heritage. You see this, uh, this uh, young man is running across the, the desert. Um, prior to being horses and everything else, all of our tribes had couriers and runners, and we moved a lot. And we don't move as much because of uh, colonization. We've been kind of held you know, and in reserves or reservations or in, 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 uh, in California when I lived there when I was a professor there, it was rancherias, you know, in these small areas designated. So once they cut off our movement, then we stop moving. And um, even being cut off now, we have to remember that, you know, we have to move, right? That, that's going to heal us. Not only does it improve our fitness and physical health, you know, uh, but it also it's our mental health, our brain's working memory, processing speed, uh, our executive function in the brain, which is the, the next three things. Our ability to delay gratification and not want that sweet sugar or want, not want that alcohol or not want someone to tell us, you know, um, that we're worthy or whatever. When we learn how to delay gratification, when we're moving and stuff, that has a very powerful um, effect on our, the building of our resilience, right? Avoiding distraction. That's another thing that when we move, we're in, in, um, when our brain's executive function says, we can stay focused. Our mind doesn't focus on what we don't have or about you know, colonization or about historical trauma or residential schools or racism, those kinds of things. I'm not saying those things aren't important. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that we can understand them, we can see them, but we cannot be like always distracted by those kinds of things because it takes a lot of brain and a lot of mental power to help, you know, to, to entertain those things that are harmful to our brains. The other thing is in cognitive flexibility. So when we move, when we move, when we run, when we just walk, you know, at a fast pace, or we walk on a treadmill, ride a bike, or whatever it is, it also improves our brain's cognitive flexibility, meaning that we have the ability to kind of see something, move to the next thing, and learn, continue to learn, right? And this is what, you know, Tribal people in, in the, in the uh, Turtle Island, you know, if you saw that 3,000-year-old um, picture on that uh, Judicula rock, we were not, we were not just like all sitting there with our own tribes, you know, and all, all we know is our own way. No, we never did that. You can see by that there were tribes that were coming from all over the place to all these places, interacting, talking, exchanging ideas, exchanging um, you know, DNA when they, you know, they would have kids, you know, uh, and uh, get married. And, but they were also exchanging, um, you know, ceremonies and those kinds of things. And cognitive flexibility is all about that, is that we have to continue to always be exchanging information if we want our brain to, to grow. Learn about other cultures, learn about language, learn about, you know, the neighbors, you know, down the road or whatever, you know. Um, so you go to the next one, is the brain-derived neurotrophic factor. So I'll, I'll come to that again, BDNF. When you move, 
it's like you pour a miracle grow in your brain. You get more neurons. You get more neurons. You have more capacities to think, to remember, to protect yourself from dementia and Alzheimer's and those kinds of things. That's really a good thing. The last one um, um, is this is something you know very new that we didn't know until just very recently in Western science, right? Exercise protects us from depression. What does it do? Well, it increases skeletal muscle, skeletal muscle chiririnine, amino transferase, for short, just called CAT, right? It increases that expression because when we sit around, when we don't move, we have this chiririnine um, met, uh, metabolism that becomes neurotoxic, KYN. This is why people stay anxiety ridden and depressed. And we as indigenous people have a genetic predisposition to depression and anxiety. That's, I found that link and I'll show you that. This is why we moved a lot and we didn't have the same kind of, of uh, anxiety and depression um, as we do now. So we can shift exercise can shift it away to the production of this curinic acid kyna right kyna that's how important exercise is that's how traditional it is this is neurodecolonization you want to decolonize your brain then you got to move you can't just like you know go to workshops or read articles those kinds of things are helpful but the body is waiting for you to execute movement how do you move? Look at this uh, young woman dancing here. Fancy dancer. What we know now is that movement also does this. It raises the level of endocannabinoid concentrations in the blood. Also singing does that. Well, wh what is that? Why is that important? Well, endocannabinoids are these, you know, um, biological messengers that help us with pain. They make us feel better. They help us feel more relaxed. You know, they make you happier. That's why when you dance or you sing and you do it, you know, you're gonna be laughing and enjoying yourself, right? Why? Because when you're doing that, this study says, and we knew that already, ancestors knew that already, but when you do those kinds of things, dancing, right? Your mood improves. When you're riding a bike, you know, your endocannabinoids are, you know, going up uh, in this particular group study. They're rising, you're feeling better. You know, they're expressing. They're making you feel happier, more relaxed. Remember that one of the first things colonization did to take away from indigenous people was their dancing and their singing. Two things that were very, and their, and their movement. Three things that protected them from depression, anxiety, suicide, historical trauma. This is not like, you wouldn't have to write a grant for this and say, well, we need to write a grant so we can have a dance club. You don't need to do that. You can dance in your living room or go and dance with people or, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm watching these uh, dances uh, all the time on Facebook where these young people are dancing, you know, um, social distance dancing. It's very cool, right? So we have to remember that. So this is a, a very recent study, as you can see, with the endocannabinoids raising because if you're singing, right, you're not just talking about one song and you're done, but you're singing and you're singing with, you know, all kinds of uh, uh, energy and also happy, you know, you don't be singing country and Western songs where you lost everything and you, you know, every, and you, somebody left you or something, you know, you want to be singing songs that make you feel good songs, you know, warrior songs, brave songs, you know, women's society songs, you know, those kinds of things, you know, um, that, that make people happy. So here's all the evidence, right? This is the Western evidence, but we have the other evidence already, indigenous people dancing. Humor, really important. Also does the same thing. Raises our endocannabinoids, makes us feel good, makes us laugh, and also uh, even harder, increases the brain-derived neurotrophic factor, the BDNF, I call it big darn native fella. That's how I remember it. Yeah, I was thinking, when I go running, I was thinking, oh, there's big darn native fellas in my brain pouring this stuff in my brain. My brain's getting you know, bigger and it's getting stronger and there's more neurons in there. So. When you think about this, I don't know, uh, I, I know a lot of tribes that love to laugh, 
you know, and, and this is what, what's been found out in the uh, cultural neuroscience research is that people with this particular kind of gene, the H or the 5-HTTLPR, or they call it the serotonin transporter gene, STG, when we have those short alleles, or they call them mutations, right? I don't think they're mutations, but I think they're, they're, they're very important to have. You know, you laugh more, you tease more, you know, you find humor in things. And um, when, you, when we have those, think about it for a second. If you're having a hard time being happy, and you're depressed all the time, and historical trauma and residential school is just keeping you down, you probably have these particular kinds of genes, serotonin genes, probably a couple of variants. You know, people that have more than one variant probably have already committed suicide or are on heavy medication. But if, let's say, you have one copy of this gene, you're going to experience more depression and anxiety than the average person. So what does it mean? Well, very simple. Laugh. You know, tease. Have humor. Tell humorous stories. Joke. Those kinds of things. Do things together that are fun, uh, that make you laugh. Because when you, when you do that, laughing improves not only your memory and learning, lowers your adrenaline-like adrenaline -like, um, 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 factors like cortisol that you know make you want to fight flight or run or those kinds of things relaxes your blood vessels you know improves your blood pressure boosts your t-cells which are good for your immunity and your endorphins your endorphins are again just like the, uh, another form of the endocannabinoid right so this last bullet point look at this this is uh, Joan Chiao is a professor very eminent professor says we've found that collectivist cultures like indigenous cultures have individuals, more individuals that carry this gene, right? What does that mean? Well, it means that probably if they're not laughing, you're going to find more people in collectivist cultures that have more depression, right? So that's something to think about. The important of the, the, the uh, effects of laughter are so important on our brain health, okay? Because humor is in our genetics. This is my res dog here sleeping on the couch but he is uh, this you know this says something about our need for sleep you can't overcome sickness and illness bad memories trauma or bad experiences or any of those kinds of things unless you're sleeping well the clock mother nature you know the um, creator has made this all possible when the sun rises, get up. When it goes down, go to sleep, right? Because if you don't, when that clock, that circadian rhythm clock is broke, it's a molecular clock. It's actually in our molecular structure. It's sensing the light. When you look at the light, your eyes are sensing that and it's sending a signal down to your molecular level. You want to decolonize your molecular you know, uh, level because it's already been colonized by, um, by you know, Western society because we have so many lights we don't go to bed when we should. Colonized by cell phones, all these things. Uh, we know it's crucial for childhood development, poor sleep, learning disabilities. Uh, when we sleep well, growth hormones and infection fighting proteins are released. Um, if we don't sleep, here's, I'm gonna give you a warning here. You're not sleeping well. You're building up in your brain what are called amyloid proteins. And amyloid proteins are a hallmark of Alzheimer's disease. So it's very important to start working on your sleep. If you're not sleeping well, could be that you're too stressed. If you're too stressed and anxiety, that means you're not moving enough. It means you're not eating right. You're not around enough people. You're not laughing enough, right? Those things are all connected. Here's the circadian rhythm. If you look at this particular slide there, you can see that, let's start at 6 a.m. in the morning. Melatonin release stops, which means then you should be waking up Right? This is just kind of an average one. You start your day by going out and getting some sunlight. Now, I don't know about folks, you know, um, all tribes, but I know that some tribes that I know that the first thing they did, the elders would do is go outside and they would sing to the sun or greet the sun or stand there with the sun. Right? Now, not all tribes could do that because a lot of them lived in very uh, you know, rainy or cloudy climates and that kind of thing. But um, they have a different circadian rhythm and it works differently. Highest alertness, you know, probably about 10.30, all the way down, best coordination, fastest reaction time, 
So if you're ever going to go in and have a you know heart procedure or brain you know procedure or something, the the doctor you have to remember the doctor's reaction time is probably best like about three o'clock in the afternoon or two o'clock or something, best coordination. You don't want to go when the doctor is you know just just uh, you know you know ready to go get some sleep at one o'clock in the morning or something. Limit caffeine, start dimming lights and so on. All this stuff is very important because um, we know that from looking at animals and even plants, all, and fish, even bugs, all have circadian rhythms. Plants move, waters move, everything moves in a rhythm. This is, this is very traditional knowledge. And again, Western science is now, just now kind of coming into circadian uh, rhythm science. Um, this is one of the things I think that's very valuable. I tell people, you know, we can't do it now because of COVID-19, but sweat lodges are good. They're very important. They're not only good for spiritual and making you feel better, but they also um, help, you know, when they're hot, they help um, in what release or what are called heat shock proteins. And heat shock proteins are in the, our cells. When we build up a lot of heat shock proteins from fasting, or you know, uh, running long, hard distances, which I don't really recommend, or sitting in a hot sauna, or ice cold water, we develop more heat shock proteins. So when you look at those pictures of people back then, why are these people look so healthy? Why don't they have so many wrinkles? Why are they living to be 100 years old? And you know, they never had modern medicine. Basically what they were doing were, there were those kinds of things. They were getting into hot places, into sa hot, you know, um, across the world, saunas have been, you know, a hot, you know, saunas have been around the world, uh, or ice cold rivers, those kinds of things to sit and pray. But when they do that, it, it creates in the body what they call a mild bioenergetic stress. And that's the good stress. Your body reads it as like, okay, I'm kind of under stress. I better release something to protect me. And what it does is releases heat shock proteins. And why, why is that important? Because heat shock proteins protect our brain. If you've ever seen a picture of a brain um, of someone who's eaten uh, a cow with mad or a beef with a mad cow disease, you'll see how the brain just gets eaten away. It looks all spongy and nasty. That's what happens to our brains as we as grow older. Not, not quite that bad, but proteins misfold and our brain begins to lose structure and function. We run, we sing, we dance, we sleep well, we um, fast. We sit in a hot sauna or a cold pool of water five minutes a day or 20 minutes every day. We're going to be protecting that body and, and really um, um, insulating and protecting ourselves from stress, you know, COVID-19. I don't, I don't really recommend doing that, all that stuff right now when you've got a disease around you like that. But if you're doing some of those things and you feel good, there's no reason you can't keep doing that. But also they protect us, you know, in the long run, our immune systems get stronger. And I think it's a brilliant way to protect ourselves from these traumatic memories, these traumatic experiences, these traumatic kinds of uh, perspectives that we have about residential schools, about boarding schools, about colonization. We have within our culture all these things that we've done that um, most people really haven't talked about much. And that's why I'm working on this particular book, but this is a presentation on this work. Um, I'm not going to talk about intermittent fasting because I don't have enough time to talk about that, but it's important to know that, you know, that this is something that we did um, uh, and we missed meals and it made us stronger when we missed meals. Now we don't miss meals. We have four meals a day plus snacks in between, right? And we have a lot of diabetes. It's not just that, you know, running and, and is going to make us lose weight. That's the poorest way, way to lose weight is by running. The best way to lose weight is by doing intermittent fasting like our ancestors did, maybe two meals a day, right? If you're diabetic, you have to check with the doctor to find out, but you should be fine. Um, uh, there's all these benefits. But let me, let me go to uh, what's happening then in the brain. As we're doing all those things, as we're running and moving, sometimes running and moving hard, we're dancing hard, laughing. If we are singing and smiling, and you know we're, we're practicing. Uh, if we're sleeping well, you know, any way we challenge ourselves in the cells in our body, we begin to develop cognitive resilience in this part of our brain. Brain, I'm sorry. 
the VMPFC, which is the ventral medial prefrontal cortex. That's in this part of the brain, kind of under the brain. I call it, um, how I remember it is very mad private first class. That's how I call it. Because the, the, that part of the brain is holding up, holding up all that resilient coping. That's why I call it the very mad private first class. But the, but the private or the soldier is doing his work or her work, right? Or their work. So this is what we see. And I can tell you that when I, some of the work that I've done with tribes in the States in different places, when I hear about their histories of how, you know, they look at the second bullet point, they train their young people how to deal with higher levels of stress and uncertainty, right? They went, had their kids fasting, they had their kids running, they had their kids, you know, um, doing things, you know, to kind of improve their health and, and uh, you know, rites of passage and those kinds of things. As they did it more and more, this part of the brain was more and more activated. You know, this is why when uh, a lot of those, you know, things happened that so many people could, could, could cope with a lot of the things that happened, right? So this is the resilient coping when you, um, in the cognitive resilience, as, I, uh, as it says, when you begin to um, stress yourself a little bit with higher levels of stress, you know, not a lot, but kind of work up to it. Right? Like if you're doing weightlifting, as you go up and you lift harder and more, your heart beats more and takes more energy. Or if you sit in a hot sauna, really on them, and then it gets, you know, you do that, and then you extend your time, extend your time. Not only are you building heat shock proteins, like what the last slide said, but you are developing resilient coping. So all these things are there. I mean, this is, you know, it's not rocket science, you know, it is neuroscience, but, but it's something but it's something to be really, really aware of, right? Um, so this is my second youngest daughter, and I want to talk just a little bit about um, mindfulness. Um, uh, what it means, you know, of course, is maintaining this, this sense of awareness and focus, right? Moment to moment. And you can focus on a word, a sound, if a dance, or whatever it is, but it's you, you increase your awareness by doing this exercise over and over again by not buying into all the thoughts that are coming in or you know rejecting thoughts that come in they come into your brain while you're meditating they're there you just go back to your breathing right um hard to do this is what it looks like the model that i made you're non-judgmental when you're doing the uh, meditation you don't attach to any thoughts or any words or feelings whether even they're good ones you pay attention to your breath as you breathe in and out very simple you accept any pain in your body or any feelings that you have, but I always stay in the present moment awareness and very powerful things that happen to the brain. Um, all these things here, preserves the brain, uh, reduces activity in the me center. And it's like, it's about us, helps with depression. Very, it's really good for depression. Uh, volume changes in the brain, increases the brain size, makes your brain function better. Only a couple of days, starts to improve the brain, reduces anxiety, and helps with addiction. So we have a very powerful ally here. So I'm not gonna go through all of these slides here because I think we've studied enough about trauma, how people have gotten their land taken away and you know, had to go to residential school. But there are things that we know that happen in the brain that when we do uh, get into meditation that um, there are some really important things that are happening in our brain like these dendritic spines, you know, um, when you see under stress, they break down. But when we get into do the practices I was talking about, then we, you know, have spinal, spinal genesis, those parts grow in our brains. Um, let's see, telomeres are also at the end of our chromosomes. When we're stressed, they get shorter and shorter like they do, you know, in this grandpa chromosome. But this little young chromosome has nice long telomeres here. And that's important because when we have long telomeres, that means we're healthier, uh, longer life. Right? Um, here's a study about kids <clears throat> in stress. We know that telomere length in kids in stressful homes, you know, um, uh, is not good because it get, they, they shorten up, right? So we know that kids that live in these stressful environments have shorter telomeres, which means they get to diseases of aging earlier. And really what that means is that, you know, as you get older, 
and these kids are eight years old or five years old and they're experiencing all this stress in the home, you know, by the time they're hitting 30, they're starting, maybe they're starting to get diabetes already. They're starting to get, you know, form, you know, the earliest um, evidence of, of uh, tumors in the brain, that kind of thing. And that's why we have to understand that colonization doesn't just happen to us. It happens at a molecular level, way down to the chromosomes and the things called telomeres. So we know that, you know, um, overweight mothers can also shorten, you know, um, uh, um, who's have a lot of stress, have shortened telomeres, which isn't good, but they can pass on those shortened telomeres to the baby. So when the baby comes out, the baby, um, you know, uh, has uh, already, the life is set up for um, a struggle throughout life. But what's interesting is that those telomeres can grow in length by doing those kinds of things, which is really, really good news. Talked about BDNF, the brain-derived neurotrophic factor, what happens in bullying, and what bullying does, it increases the social anxiety to the brain. And uh, when, you, when you're bullied, this one white mouse is bullying this little brown mouse here, um, you know, it, it signals to your body, you know, uh, depression and then suicidal behavior. Well, this, of course, that little mouse there is kind of make America great again, mouse. You know, so. Oh, there he is again. So, um, practicing mindfulness, neural decolonization, only 11 hours to show changes in white matter, which boosts brain connectivity. The brain talks better. Uh, it's my daughter practicing again. Um, increases um, gray matter in the brain, too. Um, decreases it in some places and increases it in others. So, all right, so how are we doing on time? I know I'm kind of running over a little bit. Let me, let me uh, show you some um, traditional things real quick. This is uh, a person from my tribe uh, doing um, uh, a meditation over these sacred pipes. So when he is um, um, meditating with his pipes, his brain is actually changing. You see this part of the brain here? This is the part of the brain that is related to happiness and um, well-being, sense of well-being. As he looks at the pipes and does his meditation, then there's an activation here. So this is actually protecting him from depression. All he has to do is look at these and find meaning in those. Right? You see the back of his brain is called the seeing part of the brain, the occipital lobe, and that's increased over here too. It's increased over here because He's seeing, you know, something very sacred in the brain or in the um, in, in the pipes. These are men in my tribe back in about 1900 singing to this tree. Uh, the tree is a female deity or de female figure symbol. And uh, what happens is that their telomeres are increasing. I just talked about that, getting longer, which is good. But this part of the brain here, you go back, the parietal lobe is decreasing, which is good. Because once this decreases, they actually make a connection to the tree because the parietal lobe is the part of the brain that um, keeps us separate from those kinds of things. So now we know all the spiritual leaders, in different tribes, as they quieted this part of the brain, they became one with the trees, the eagles, the lands, the rivers, those kinds of things. So um, there's another Urka guy uh, meditating, all these things happening. So we put it all together, you see this thing, neurodecolonization is these women are blessing these kids. And all these things are happening in their brains and in their DNA and in their neurochemistry, right? These things are all happening in, of course, their brain waves. So, and, and of course, their chromosomes. Dances are like that, and, and uh, this, this is from the uh, coast. But when, when I talked about dancing earlier, how powerful that is, uh, that's what I'm talking about. So you see that we had all kinds of uh, dances. The, the middle one is from my tribe. We, we had bear dancers. This is a, a Yupi dancer here. I think it's, he's doing a seal dance, I believe. Anyway, so I'm gonna stop there and stop sharing and um, see if there are any questions. Thank you so much, Michael. Anyone who has questions, you are welcome to unmute yourself and speak over the video or just enter your questions into the chat bar as we were doing yesterday for anyone. Okay. So. 
Thank you, comment for you, Michael. Well, I know, I know it's a lot of information to cover in 45 minutes. I hope it was uh, at least somewhat thought provoking. Um, Michael, can I ask a question? If nobody's yeah. right away. So what do you um, experience is sort of the, the most significant, um, in a sense, like blockage to people engaging with these practices, like movement and action and sweat lodges, everything that you talked about, like what, what gets in the way for people? Um, I think, you know, a lot of people, you know, I think in the past have kind of been discouraged from doing these things. I think Western sort of approaches don't really uh, promote, you know, this stuff because, you know, um, they don't know the science behind it yet, even though it's in the science, the Western science. I mean, that's part of it. But I think um, what it's really going to take, I think, uh, to get people uh, interested in that is to, um, you know, start doing some of these things, you know, for individuals to start doing some of these things. So I think, you know, I think time is one thing. Our time has been colonized. Our bodies have been colonized. Our thinking has been colonized so that we don't really find a lot of um, value in some, some of these things. But the other thing, the, the Western sciences has really said, oh, you know, you feel anxiety? Well, I gotta, we have a pill for that, right? And all, all it does is blunt our feelings. It doesn't solve, you know, the, the, um, the issue at, at the basic level in the body, right? We can't solve it out there either because you know it's the injustices are still going on but we can respond to it much differently in a more natural way you know by doing some of these practices so so, so it looks like richard has yeah. a comment right okay um yeah so i think you know Right now, epigenetics is, is really, a, really a cool science, but we have to be very careful because, um, you know, I didn't get to get to the very end of the presentation, but there are differences in people, for example. I mean, not everyone's gonna suffer the same way that other people are gonna suffer. Not everyone's gonna have the same epigenetic expression from intergenerational trauma. Uh, one of the things I was going to mention today is that there are kids, the, the, all these studies have gone on recently about what they call dandelion kids, orchid kids, and tulip kids. Well, the dandelion kids, they find out these kids that are really tough and they're kind of out to, they're in different, uh, you know, cultures throughout the world. And they can, you know, they don't really get the intergenerational trauma. They can walk through it, you know. They can say, yeah, it was bad, you know, uh, that was bad, but, you know, I got through it. And they can laugh and they can keep on going. Other kids that may have uh, what they call this glucocorticoid um, variant in the genes um, are more sensitive. It's all about how sensitive a kid is. You, you should never tell a kid you're too sensitive because if they are, you do, too, do think a kid is too sensitive, they probably have this particular uh, glucocorticoid um, uh, gene. Uh, and, and if they do, you know, that's that you have something you have to watch because sensitivity then can mean they're more, you know, uh, predisposed to depression and anxiety and maybe suicide. But we also know from the studies that those kids who are, who are, who are orchid kids, I should have said orchid kids, uh, who are very sensitive also have all these amazing capabilities, you know, for art and for science and for leadership and for intelligence. And they're very, very creative folks, right? Then you've got the other ones in the middle, right? They have a different epigenetic, kind of part of this and part of that epigenetic, right? They're called the tulip kids, you know? And they're, they, they do pretty well as long as they get good support. The ones that need the most support are the, are the orchid kids because they're the most sensitive. And then the tulip kids are next level. And, but the dandelion kids you're gonna find in our Aboriginal communities and all over the place, that these are the tough little kids that get, can get through those kinds of things. So that's very important, you know, to kind of understand that there are different sensitivities to traumatic events, like you're saying, yeah. Other questions? So I think, Michael, there was a question from Jody just about where um, the listeners can find your other articles and presentations. 
Yeah, I did. I did put on there. I, I put. Um, uh, and I'll put it on again. It's called. It's in um, indigenousmindfulness.com. Okay. Let's go to this here. to everyone. I guess I should have been to everyone. So um, that's where I have um, some different videos. I have uh, some different articles. I've got a new book coming out um, in October uh, that has um, some of this information in there. Um, um, it's, um, it's called uh, Decolonizing Pathways to Integrative Health and Social Work, or I'm um, sorry, Integrative Social Work. So um, I've covered uh, some of that, this information in there. So a co-author, I should say, on this book. Um, but I'll definitely um, keep you, um, you know, um, informed of where that's at. We just finished the last of it and sent it to the publisher. So uh, that should be coming out. Rutledge is pu publishing our book. So, um, but I've got this other book. Uh, the information you saw today is in another book that I'm, uh, I will start working on July 1st. You know, I've got big chunks of it done. So I want to get that done within this next, you know, six months or so. If no one else has any other questions, I'd like to ask one more, if that's okay, Michael. As um, as an indigenous sure, organization, uh, wanting to implement your methods and wisdom and science, um, are there sort of first steps or steps that you would encourage to be taken um, to sort of, I don't know, bring people into this work in an effective way? Yeah, I think, you know, I mean, I know there's a lot of science and a lot of you know science terms in, in this um, presentation. I think the first thing is to is to kind of demystify some of that, you know, and and just to talk about, you know, how, you know, these these different practices. You know, I, I broke them down to eight, but there's probably more like twelve practices. How achievable they are, and why they're important. And then if you have an agency and you're doing the agency work like you're talking about I think how do you put that into your um, into your um, um, you know your practice how do you put that together in practice right how do you train your people to, to um, you know say listen you know uh, we're gonna do we're gonna do it you know we invested we, we bought a sauna for our organization right and, th and they don't cost a lot of money you can buy these little barrel saunas for about eight people or whatever do some fundraising if you need to or whatever and you guys buy a sauna people go into the sauna and you know maybe for a week you have a lesson about heat shock proteins and what they do for the body what do they do for the brain you know and then related to that discussion i was talking about how people for thousands of years have been doing this this is nothing new it's very traditional human activity right it's, it's uh, doctors are not going to say, well, you boy, you're, you're very, you got a lot of anxiety. You, you should be taking more saunas, you know. They're not going to say that because they, they see it differently. They think that they have, you know, the answer, which is let me give you an anti-anxiety medication or antidepressant, right? And um, we know that, you know, we're moving away from that medicine, I think, um, at a pretty good rapid pace. So I think that's the thing is to kind of start thinking about you know, what are some of those things that we can do, right? Uh, to begin to, you know, activate some of those things. If you, can, if you can show people that, you know, going out for walks every day and then slowly getting them up to run, you know, even, you know, I was, I was watching these videos of this elder, he's like 97 years old running up this hill, you know? Um, and I, I look at a lot of those because people say, well, I'm too old, I can't do that. And like. You know, I'm, I'm looking at people, you know, in their mid 90s and 90 years old that are like very active, you know, doing that, you know, and can everybody do that? No, of course. Why? Well, because they haven't, you know, they just don't do it. So I think that's the thing is to is to convince people that it, it's important to start these things that could be all those things I talked about could be, um, you know, used in, in a therapeutic, um, you know, setting. So you can do this, but this is our, okay, you're doing this, talk therapy, but over here, these are, did, how many times did you do a sauna this week? How many times did you walk and run? How many times did you sing? How many times did you dance? How well did you sleep? I think you have to build an assessment around all those kinds of things, so. Thank you. 
Anyone else have any questions before we let Michael go? Um, I think we're probably okay. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, we've got a few people saying thank you. This has been such a great presentation. I really hope that we can uh, connect with you again and ask you to bring your wisdom back to our organization. It's been wonderful to have you. Well, I appreciate the opportunity and thank you for all the, all, all the uh, very positive comments and thank you all for um, participating. So, um, and thank you for the good work that you do too as well, so. Thanks so much. Thanks everyone for being here and uh, hopefully we'll see you all tomorrow at 2.30 with Dr. Jeannie Paul. So have a great evening. Thanks again, Michael. Thank you.